All right, let's get it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. Anybody else think that that warrant that they serve today and the arrest are just guaranteed shenanigans next Monday and Tuesday? Yep. Actually, maybe tomorrow. I think they're supposed to have their first appearance tomorrow. I'm here for all of it. Matter of fact, just do it all June. Trying to get uh, get my backyard done. I mean, it could go the opposite way. I mean, we've been putting pressure on them and attacking them from all different angles. At some point, they, they've got to give up. I mean, especially if we're going after all the money. It, it could shut them down. Yeah, I'm just waiting. Like, couldn't they wait until, like, Wednesday of next week to do this? Is that when you're off? <laughs> no, that's when all this, the finance committee would have been done. Would have been done by Wednesday. Ah, uh, okay. I don't know, they had to send a message. I get it, but I mean, think about it. If if they had just defeated the thing in, you know, in council, which, you know, if they're going to vote for the money and everything's going to go through, and then the coup de Gracie is, oh, right after you failed two days in a row, we serve a warrant on you. True, that's what they did the last round. I guess they wanted to, uh, you know, go ahead and get it over with. I guess they thought it was going on in the offensive. The Atlanta Solidarity Fund, an organization that I've worked with when Rayshard Brooks was killed by the police. We had to engage in protest and bonding people out of jail and hiring attorneys. Many of us were up four or five o'clock in the morning. Everybody from the Atlanta Solidarity Fund, well, they were solid. That action continues. They are still fighting the good fight. Mr. Marlon Counts was one of the individuals inside of the home when the home was raided. You just heard a recording from the police talking about the raid in open, common conversation between themselves about what really happened. It was politically motivated is what they're telling you. Mr. Counts, welcome to Indisputable. Glad to be here. All right, um, I hate this happened to you. I'm glad that there is a level of awareness about why, because of the recording, obviously, and some other factors that are happening. Take us to that day, what happened? What did you think was going down when all of these SWAT members came inside of your home? Well, you know, I've been saying when it first happened, you know, when, when uh, you know, what happened was I woke up. Um, to the sound of my front door being broken down by a battering ram. That was the first that I learned that any of this was happening. Um, and, and when it first happened, I thought that it must be a mistake. It was so surreal, so preposterous of, a, of an attack uh, that I thought this you know, had to be uh, unintentional in some way. But, uh, but it was far from that, you know, as we've learned since then. Um, you know, officers, uh, dozens of SWAT officers, surrounded the house, they had automatic weapons, they had riot shields, they had come ready for a fight. They were planning to throw flashbang grenades into my living room um, before we were fortunately able to quickly surrender, be arrested. Um, but this kind of raid is, is the kind of militarized response that you expect to be sent against a drug kingpin, you know, not the administrators of a nonprofit organization. Um, it's absurd to the point of, of theatrics, you know, and I think that really is, you know, as that recording suggests, this was intended not as a legitimate law enforcement response. This was intended as a message. It was intended as a threat to us as well as to any other grassroots political organizers in the city, um, that you are in danger and you are a target if you continue to oppose the agenda of Cop City. I had a judge, I had a judge, Marlon, who called me off record and said, that is the scariest thing I have seen in a long time. Now, let's go back to when you got arrested with the other two. DeKalb County is the county that covers the jurisdiction, but it is annexed city of Atlanta, it is still Atlanta. But you go to DeKalb County, you get a DeKalb County magistrate judge who sets the bond. In addition to this egregious act, the prosecutor requested no bond. And the judge basically said, well, wait a minute, 
no, I mean, that, that, that's, that doesn't make sense. Tell us about that moment and how the judge pushed back on the narrative of the prosecutor. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes to the ridiculously baseless nature of these charges that the first judge who set eyes on them, who, you know, he isn't even asked to make judgments about the facts of the matter. Right. right? He's just asked to set bond. But as soon as he sees the arrest warrants, his first reaction is, this is not impressive. That's right. The quote is, there's not a lot of meat on these bones. And he immediately goes against the prosecution's request, grants bond. Um, I, you know, I don't know what else we need to demonstrate that these charges are baseless. Um, you know, if, if even judges are acknowledging this at this point. Yeah. And the judge that did so, I did some background on the judge, seasoned judge, worked in Fulton County and DeKalb County, does not make statements just freely, understood exactly what he was saying, wanted it to be on record, obviously, uh, as a seasoned judge like him would do. Let's talk about the fallout that started to take place before this even happened. Because the reality is they started a messaging campaign against you all, saying that you all were domestic terrorists, categorizing you as if there's this major danger and violent organization, dangerous and violent organization inside of the community. Did you not see this would possibly happen? Or did you still believe, well, there's a limit they will go and then they won't go beyond that limit? What were your thoughts then? Well, you know, maybe it was naive, but I did imagine that there was some kind of limit, some kind of you know constraint in terms of respecting the rule of law on the part of police and prosecutors. But what we've seen really over the past two years is a sustained pattern of just indefinite escalation mm. by the police in terms of the amount of aggression that they're willing to pursue against protesters and the scope of who they're willing to target. You know, they started out just targeting people who showed up at protest rallies. Then they began going after people who were simply around at events that seemed to be associated with the cop city, you know, protest movement, you know, arresting people at music festivals, for example. And now we're seeing them go a step further. Um, you know, and attacking people in their homes who aren't even involved in the Stop Cop City movement directly, but are simply providing resources to help those protesters assert their rights, protect themselves in court, and you know, not be targeted by malicious prosecution. Um, and this really makes me wonder where this goes next. You know, if they keep expanding the scope, who are they coming after next? I received that um, tape of the officers talking to each other about what happened. I received that tape um, over the weekend. And as I'm listening to it, I'm like, wow, there's this level of awareness among law enforcement about what they are supposed to do. Because they say they keep pounding you all and y'all need to just give up, right? When you heard that tape of these cops talking openly about political items and finance committees and targeting you all for so long you should give up. What was going through your mind? Well, I mean, I have to say hearing that didn't surprise me. You know, this is the kind of thing that we've understood is going on for a long time. The only shocking thing about it is that the police are so cavalier to acknowledge it. Right. right? They're saying the quiet part out loud, which is that the purpose of these attacks you know, it has nothing to do with enforcing the law, punishing people who've broken the law. It's purely political maneuverings. Um, and it's political maneuverings straight from the top, right? It's coming from Governor Kemp, it's coming from the Attorney General, trying to make an example of left grassroots organizers in Atlanta. And the chilling part is that even, uh, you know, progressive. Um, Officials in the city seem to be going along with this agenda rather than pushing back on it. You know, as you mentioned, Sherry Boston, the DA in DeKalb County, is the one whose charges are actually pending against us, right? Like we're being charged by a progressive DA um, who could drop these charges at any time, um, but who is instead, you know, falling in line with this kind of far right agenda that's coming from the governor, basically to posture for his presidential bid. That he's tough on the left and that he, you know, pursues crime aggressively. You know, I think all of your charges will be dropped. So I do believe that wholeheartedly. But the damage may be done, right? They wanted to damage your reputation, they wanted to damage the operation. Remember, you all are the conduit 
for individuals who protest who may not be rich. And they need to be bailed out of jail when something goes down or they need access to legal um, assistance, right? These are all things codified within the constitution. These are rights that you have. So while people may disagree with your political ideology, they should agree with every single one of us on the principle that this should never happen. What is your message to them? Those who may be against what you're doing politically, they should still be for you based on principle. Absolutely, I'm glad you bring that up because in my mind, what has happened here is much bigger than us, you know, than our experience. And it's bigger even than the issue of Cop City. This is really getting to this core question of what is the future of democracy in Georgia? Because if it's possible for police and prosecutors to pursue this level of militarized violence and repression against basically just their political opponents, people who they don't appreciate the organizing of, this is gonna have a tremendous effect on all types of organizing campaigns in the state going forward. And we really can't afford to allow that kind of precedent to be set um, in our case or in any other cases going forward. And that's why we're determined to fight this um, and why it's so important that the public at large, that civil society reject this kind of attack on you know, the fundamentals of the democratic process. That's right. Um, I spoke to some of the young leaders a couple of days ago. Obviously, City Hall was packed out, wee hours of the morning, right? Vote still goes down. Why? Because the members of council had their mind made up. They were going to vote how they were going to vote. Uh, but there's an opportunity to still have the voices heard. If there's a petition that has 73,000 signatures roughly, you all can put it on the ballot. It becomes a ballot initiative, a referendum. Have you all explored that and talked openly about that process? Well, and you know, I'm a spokesperson for the Atlanta Solidarity Fund, not for the movement against Cop City. Um, there are many other organizers who, you know, have a, a stronger and more strategic view on what that campaign looks like. Um, my main concern is whether any of those organizers and that campaign or others will be able to pursue the, you know, the the legal and civilly valid strategies that they want without malicious prosecution and police mm -hmm. violence being used to suppress them, right? We're talking about very basic democratic processes, pursuing a, a referendum, attending a city council meeting. These are things that people are now terrified to do for fear of being designated as terrorists, for fear of having their door kicked down. And this is exactly like you said, the sort of extrajudicial intention of these charges. It's not to get convictions, it's not to win in court, it's to make people scared to engage in protest and democratic process. We cannot allow that to happen. And so I hope that people feel inspired to continue with whatever type of protest they believe is appropriate. Um, you know, without being intimidated, we are certainly not going to stop our work in defending the rights of all protesters. Such a principled approach. I told my viewers last week about a moment where I was working with you all a few years ago. We were, it was sloppy, man. We were taking money here and there, cash out, we were getting people out of jail. We had attorneys involved, NAACP, Jill Griggs was with us helping. And um, I tried to hand someone a hundred dollar bill just to say, get you something to eat. It was like four in the morning. They said, no, doc, put that in the fund. And that's the kind of integrity you all always have brought. So when I saw this happen, I already knew what it was. Marlon, we appreciate your continued advocacy. I'm glad you are not a scared individual. You're standing up. You are to me what leadership should be about. Thank you for your stance. I appreciate you bringing attention to this. Absolutely.